Matthews come to the Tank Museum in Dorset to find out what happened to George during that first ever tank offensive. So what we've got here is what was designed... David Willey is the museum's curator. This is a Mark I tank, and it's exactly the type that was used on that very first tank attack in 1916. How many people inside each one? Eight. Eight soldiers. Eight. So if we, if we walk this way, we can have a look at our Mark, uh, Mark IV tank. Watch your head. Oh. Right, shall I go and... Uh... Yeah, if you go up to the front there and um, sort of squeeze your way in there... I'll try. Oh, that's it. One forward, Quite one cozy. back. So the seat you're actually in there, that's okay. where George McPherson would have been sitting as commander of a Mark I tank. That's uh -huh. the commander's position. Designed to be impervious to machine gun fire, the tanks were expected to crush through the German barbed wire, clearing a path for the infantry. So what was it like in here for those eight men? There's no suspension on this tank, so every bump you go over, you're going to feel. The engine in the middle of the tank, once it's been running for half an hour, it's leaking carbon monoxide into the cab. Yeah. The exhaust coming out the top, they're glowing red hot, so it's baking hot in here, and it's so noisy, you can't hear yourself talk. And you've got kind of whirring chains, exposed a machinery absolutely. that you're going to... Working part. This is a health and safety nightmare. Of course, <laughs> it wouldn't be allowed nowadays. And that, of course, is all before the enemy starts firing at you. Well, I've had enough of being in here, and it's only been 10 minutes or so, and uh, I can't imagine being in here for hours on end. Conditions in the tanks were appalling. But what led George to take his own life? Uh, these, uh... Trevor Pigeon has written a book about the battle based on the memoirs of tank commander Basil Henriquez, a close friend of George. This is Henriquez the tall fellow, six foot three inches of him, mm. and next door to them is uh, George going over Waterloo Bridge to Waterloo Station to go down to Southampton for the crossing. After only a few weeks training in the new tanks, George and Henriquez were on their way to the Battle of the Somme. And their task was to destroy one of the most formidable parts of the German front line, this whole area, the quadrilateral and that was a, a very, very difficult nut to crack. On the 15th of September, 1916, they led their tanks towards the German lines. Henriquez described their advance in his memoir. Neither George nor I had done any reconnaissance mm -hmm. at all over the shell-pocked Somme battlefield. Maps meant nothing in such an area, for there are no landmarks. After 100 yards, George stopped with engine trouble. Oh, so quite quickly he was... Um, he, he was, was out of action. He was kind of, yeah, he redundant. He was out of, the, out of the running. And then uh, Henriquez had to go on without him. And once he'd got into no man's land, he was subjected to the most horrendous barrage of fire from the German quadrilateral. And curiously, in this particular area, they had uh, armor-piercing bullets. Henriquez was forced to turn back to headquarters. While George, his tank repaired, was preparing to head back into the fray. Henriquez, covered in blood all over his face, yeah. his crew lying on the floor, feeling absolutely shattered by this experience. George just said goodbye, got into his tank, and drove away. In no man's land, George met with devastating fire from the German trenches. He was forced to withdraw. George came back down this road. He got out of his tank, he left his crew, and he withdrew a short distance. 
And he took out his revolver and shot himself. Mm. The most terrible thing. But... Why did he do it? Yeah, of course. I, there are, there are m many possible reasons, Matthew. One is that he saw that he saw the devastation that was uh, visible all around him when he got up onto this plateau. The dead, the dying, the wounded, the smoke and the fumes and everything else. A, a hell hole. It really was hell. And he may have thought, why did I break down earlier? Why did my tank uh, yeah. break down earlier? Was it my fault? Well, it wasn't. And I can imagine the brigadier down here at Wedgwood before this young boy went into battle. Now, look here, my boy. There are three divisions held up here. Mm. It's up to you to destroy that. You go up and do it. Here, Henriquez describes a nervous strain, the trauma they were going through with this, mm. in this battle. Mm. Uh, if you read that. The nervous strain in this first battle of the tanks for officers and crew alike was ghastly. Of my company, one officer went mad and shot his engine to make it go faster, and another shot himself because he thought he had failed to do as well as he ought. Mm. But that he doesn't, he obviously doesn't say that that's. He doesn't, was... he doesn't say that is George. But there was only one officer in C Company to die on that day. And right. the one casualty was George. And, I mean, his mother and his sister would never have found out. They would no. never have been told. No, they didn't. No. I think we've got to be clear here, Matthew. This was not, in my view, a matter of cowardice. On the contrary, mm. this is a man with a deep, deep sense of duty and honour. Letting the side down was not something that anybody wanted to do. This is anathema to any schoolboy of the age. Mm. It is now, I'm sure. And certainly somebody coming fresh out of Winchester. This, this man, this boy, had been at school the year before. And head man, head boy. That's right. Mm. Tragic. What's really come out from today is just the complete contrast from, you know, his time at Winchester, which was obviously so successful, and then this nightmarish day and this sudden decision to take his own life because he felt that he fell short, and that's just... It's just so tragic. You know, what, what standards was he holding himself to? That was just a lost generation on my father's side of the family. Three out of six of the men in that generation, well, I mean, I call them men, but they weren't, they were boys. They just, they just left school and they had their whole lives in front of them. And it just seems such a waste.